The title of, of my presentation is, is, could, could be a bit problematic, Church Revitalization in a Post-Pandemic World, when the reality of it is we are not post-pandemic. Uh, e even in the States, uh, we're still very aware of that. As a matter of fact, uh, tomorrow I'll be getting on a flight for the first time in, gosh, probably 14 months. And so we're, 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 we are emerging. Uh, and I certainly said here in the news of Nova Scotia and what is taking place there. But we're all at different levels right now, depending upon which of the 50 states that you're entering the provinces of Canada. Uh, I understand that as well. So the nomenclature of post-pandemic may not seem like it is the perfect nomenclature for you right now. But what I'm speaking of is once the pandemic is, is to a certain point where you can say that we feel as if we are emerging, what is church life going to look like? And what is it going to look like for my church specifically? I do want you to understand this, that uh, uh, my dominant spiritual gift uh, is really ignorance. And I exercise that gift quite a bit. Uh, and what I mean by that is I really don't know a lot, but I, I am able to listen a lot. And we have between 200 and 250,000 churches that are somehow connected with Church Answers, and we're constantly getting information. It may come in the form of social media. It may come in the form of uh, comments on the blog or a podcast, or it may come in through a webinar, but we're constantly getting feedback. So the information that you are hearing is not some type of false wisdom from Rainer as much as it is. I like to refer to these as dots that are out there. And our role is to connect the dots. We're, we're able to hear from thousands, no tens of thousands of churches, and we're able to uh, connect the dots. Uh, our, our primary audience has been North America, although it is expanding globally now and uh Really, some, some of our biggest foci have been is on the continent of Africa lately. And so we're getting a good, good view of the global picture. So I'm going to share with you, uh, again, this seems kind of uh, uh, a little bit linear to share 10 major points in a post-pandemic world, but it may keep me organized and it certainly can help you to know where I am in the context of my presentation. So as I go through 45 minutes and 10 points, you can know right where I am and where, where I'm referring. And so I will get, I will go to each of these points and I'm going to elaborate upon them and then we'll have time for Q and A uh, at, at the 45 minute point. So let me go on right into this point. Number one, there are two key developments that are taking place in the pandemic and in the post-pandemic world. Those two words I refer to as acceleration and exacerbation. Allow me to kind of unpack that a bit. What we are seeing as a result of COVID, what we are seeing as a result of what has happened culturally, uh, demographically, and specifically ecclesiologically within churches is is not that trends have been dramatically altered in the, in the sense that they have been discontinued or new trends are on the, on the horizon, as much as it has been that trends that were taking place have now accelerated or been exaggerated or been exacerbated. So what we were seeing before the pandemic, think 2019 and think where your church was and whatever trends that we were seeing, say between 2015 and 2019, we go into COVID in 2020 and now we're in 2021. What we're seeing is many of those trends have, if, if they were going at a certain process, they were going at a more rapid process now. Just as an example, if churches were declining and the rate of decline as an example, was 3% per year. What we are seeing is coming out of this, even though we don't know precisely what 2022 and 2023 will look like, according to what the projections are coming from many of the church leaders we're hearing, is that number will actually be greater. We know it'll be greater in 2021 coming out of the pandemic. We know that uh, many churches were not meeting in 2020, but we even see that in 2023 as we move forward. I don't mean this as fatalistic or pessimistic, either one of these. You will hear why we're saying that as we, as, as we go further. But the trends that were taking place have now been accelerated and exacerbated. And 
we, we see that as a result of COVID. Uh, uh, for example, the company where I used to be CEO, Lifeway, we were we introduced uh, what we call WFA about uh, seven years years ago from today when I was still at Lifeway. And WFA means work from anywhere. Uh, you may use that terminology, that acronym yourself. Uh, but we started uh, a WFA at Lifeway about seven years ago, not at all anticipating a pandemic, but simply saying we saw where things were changing in the workforce. And we didn't do our entire employee base as work from anywhere, but we we, we would say, according to the manager in this organization, we had about 5,000 employees. According to the manager and mm-hmm. in, in one of the managers in the organization, uh, they may have someone that stays from home two days, works from home two days a week or three days a week. The reason we did it is because of national traffic and the commute was getting awful. And we knew that in order to recruit, uh, Amazon had just moved in uh, another 5,000 employees into downtown Nashville. and We're taking tech uh, employees one after another. We knew in order to compete, we had to have a competitive edge. And so we went work from anywhere as one of the fringe benefits of employees. So we started that. And, and many companies were. In fact, we were one of the first large companies that signed up with a company that we all have familiarity with called Zoom. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we were the largest company that Zoom had at one time. There's no way we are we would be anymore. But that trend of WFA work from anywhere, what happened during the pandemic, of course, it has been accelerated. It has been exacerbated well beyond the quarantine. It will continue to take place. So that's what we're seeing in churches. So let's, let's unpack this a little bit more. Point number two, the first point is the two key developments in the pandemic, acceleration and exacerbation. Point number two in this is the final death of cultural Christianity. If you're looking in North America, there are going to be many points in Canada where cultural Christianity has been dead for quite a while. You're going to see many points in the U.S., particularly Northeast, Northwest, and Far West, where cultural Christianity has been dead for some time. But, uh, for example, in the States, in the Deep South, and some of the Midwest, cultural Christianity was very much alive going into the pandemic. Now, what do I mean by cultural Christianity? A cultural Christianity is a person who says that he or she is a Christian or that he or she is affiliated with the church in order to be culturally accepted, maybe in the workplace, maybe in the business world, maybe in politics, or maybe just socially in our neighborhoods and in our friendships. There are many places prior to the pandemic, particularly uh, in, in more of what would be called the mythical Bible belt in the U S uh, that, that, uh, you 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 were not culturally accepted if you were not a Christian. Now, I understand that's not the case in many places across the world and in many places in Canada today. But what has happened during the pandemic is people stop attending worship services. What has happened during the pandemic is cultural Christians have said through their actions that it is okay not to attend church. They, they, they don't lose any cultural credibility by not being connected to a church. They don't lose any cultural Christi- uh, credibility by not, by, by, by not saying that they are a Christian. They are saying culture accepts me just fine the way I am, whether I'm a Christian or not. Now, I understand that trend had been going on for some time in North America, but what happened during the pandemic is we have basically seen the death of cultural Christianity, though there are pockets of it still alive here and there. Cultural Christianity is gone. Now, what are the implications behind that? It depends on where you are. If you're in a region where cultural Christianity was almost dead anyway, the, the reaction after the pandemic or the results after the pandemic are minimal related to cultural Christianity. If you're in some points where cultural Christianity was more prominent, you could see 20, 30, 40, 50% of your congregation not return because they really were not Christians. They were Christians in name only, cultural Christians. But I think that this is a phenomenon that we will look back upon, not only in North America, but in key parts around the globe. I think that it's a, it's a phenomenon that we'll look on and we'll say that, hey, as a result of, of COVID, this trend has, has really presented itself in its, in its final state, at least for a season, until God 
should change that. So that is one of the trends that we have seen that has been exaggerated or exacerbated. Number three, this trend is also one that has been exaggerated and exacerbated, accelerated, I should say, and exacerbated by the by the uh, pandemic. Number three is understanding the trend of attendance frequency. Our, our research team has been looking at churches for some time, both in the previous years at Lifeway and then before that with a consulting group called Rainer Group and now with Church Answers. And we've been asking the question, when a church declines numerically, attendance-wise, not membership-wise, but attendance-wise, when a church declines, what are some of the causative factors, not from a motivation point of view, but from an action point of view? What are some of the causative factors? The number one causative factor in North America for the past 10 years of decline in attendance has been the issue of attendance frequency. Simple example, you have a church with 200 members. Of those 200 members, 200 people attend every week. What is your attendance? You probably already got it figured out, it's 200. That same group, 200 members, starts attending not necessarily in tandem, but at different points every other week, or they're there twice a month. What is the attendance of the church? Now it's 100. I want you to hear what just happened. A church of 200 members declined by 50% without losing anyone. In other words, what happened was the church and the members who were there started attending less frequently. That has been a phenomenal trend that we have seen across North America, really for the last 20 years, exaggerated and exacerbated by the pandemic. And in many parts, a, an active Christian was someone who was considered where they, their attendance in their local congregation was three to four times a month. And now, an active Christian in most definitions is considered someone who is their active church member, I should say, is someone who is there twice a month. And so we are now defining active membership or, or, or active in a congregation as someone who is there every other week. And that's how we're defining active. The, the curve has, has, has changed significantly, and the pandemic has both accelerated and exacerbated that reality that now it is okay not to attend as frequently. And we've looked at all kind of cultural and spiritual reasons behind it. I'm not going to get into that. If you end up having questions about it, we, we can always pursue that more. But the reality of it is in most churches today, more members do not feel compelled for social, cultural, or other reasons to attend as frequently as they did. So when it's all when it's all said and done, when it's all said and done, we have our members, even those who are considered the most active in our churches, attending less frequently. Uh, I, I will say this: that one of the reasons for this, I said I wasn't going to go into all the reasons, but let's at least talk about one of them. One of the reasons is prior to the pandemic, the bar for being a part of a church congregation has been lowering significantly. In other words, we have dumbed down the meaning of church membership so much that it's becoming less commitment than more commitment. And there, there are even those who say we should not use the vernacular of, of, of uh, uh, the nomenclature of membership. And basically what that is doing is abandoning, for example, 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul uses the metaphor of the body of Christ, and you are a member of the body of Christ. This is something that had strong meaning in first century Christianity and then beyond. Uh, but we have dumbed it down in many of our churches where membership has more of a social club or even a country club connotation to it. And therefore, it becomes serve us and we come when we feel like it rather than what our commitment level is. I could go on and on about that. But the whole issue of attendance frequency has been a huge issue in particularly North American churches. Number four, the needed revival of evangelism, the needed revival of evangelism. 
that's almost one of those duh comments. Of course, we need our churches to be more evangelistic. What were Christ's last words? Well, depends on where you want to read them, but they all have to do with being his witnesses. Acts 1.8. The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Matthew 28. Don't start Matthew 28 at 19, beginning at verse 18, where he says, all authority has been given to me in the heaven and earth. And then go and make disciples of all nations. And so, as Jesus, right before he ascended, his last words were, go make disciples, be my witnesses, go. Do tell people in broadening spheres of influence, go and tell them. Now, why do I say something that is just blatantly obvious to you, church leaders? Why do I, why do I even worry about uh, uh, talking about evangelism? Quite frankly, it is because most churches have gotten away from a priority or even an emphasis on evangelism. And let me just say this a little more bluntly. Most church leaders have gotten away from a priority or an emphasis on evangelism. And as a result, we use, let me just back up a minute. Churches used to grow by transferring one church membership to another or cultural Christians coming because they wanted to be accepted. Well, the latter certainly is not occurring anymore. More and more, if we are going to reach people in our church, for our churches, but even more so for the kingdom of God, for the glory of God, the only way that we're going to see any significant numbers reach is to become more intentionally evangelistic. And, and, and may I say this as we talk about becoming intentionally evangelistic? I read, I just, well, I didn't read it. I just said it from memory. Two passages of scripture, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 and Acts 1, 8. Both of those passages begin with either prayer, the power of the Holy Spirit or the authority of Christ. In other words, when we do evangelism, we don't do so in some type of human centric power. We do so in the power of God. And the, the whole idea of doing evangelism is one of the more supernatural things of Christ's command to us. And yet in many of our churches, we have become so focused on doing the business of the church with busyness, we're forgetting the business of the kingdom with God's business. And, and it is just as simple as it can be, but it is not necessarily easy when I say simple. If we do not turn more and more to true gospel endeavors, reaching people with the gospel of Christ, doing evangelism, our churches will dry up because there's not going to be other any other people to reach as there have been in the past where we've had Christians move from one church to another or cultural Christians come in. So this needed revival of evangelism is not merely good for the health of the church. It is obedience to one of the, the major command that God gave us before his son Christ ascended into heaven. So this needed revival of evangelism. Number five is understanding the principles of the harvest fields, understanding the principles of a harvest field. I am blessed uh, in many ways, but I'll tell you uh, this particular way. Uh, I have three sons. Even more importantly, I have 11 grandchildren. Uh, you know what happens to your children when you have grandchildren, your children become irrelevant, but I'm, I still, I still kind of like my, my three sons a good bit. All three of my sons are in vocational ministry. Two of them are pastors. One of them's a executive leader of a seminary. And, and, and one of them is my pastor here in Nashville. And a few years ago, I made a commitment. Uh, it's only between me and God. It's not necessarily prescriptive for anybody, but I, but I had traveled so much for so many years I made a commitment a few years ago. It's been about five years now where I said, I wasn't going to travel on Sunday. In other words, I was not going to preach in another pulpit. I have served as a pastor for churches. I served as a dean of a seminary for a dozen years. I served as a CEO of a Christian company for a dozen years. And in the, the latter two roles, I did a lot of weekend traveling and speaking in other pulpits. And five years ago, I made a commitment that I was going to stay 
in a church and just be a church member. Many years ago, I wrote a little book called I Am a Church Member. And I said, well, if I'm going to write and talk about being a church member, maybe it'd be a good idea for me to be a church member. And so uh, my son started a church here in the Nashville area about five years ago. And uh, I wasn't on his founding group, but once they started moving out of their home into uh, uh, rented facilities, I did, I did join them. And one of the great joys I have is being in that church almost every Sunday. And there's sometimes, uh, I know for you Canadians, this may sound like I'm, a, I'm, I'm really, re- really too sensitive to cold weather. But if it ever gets cold here in Nashville, I go visit my other son in Southwest Florida where, and go listen to him preach. But other than that, I am here. I am here in the Nashville area uh, every single Sunday, almost from day one. My son has led our church to have a close or a benediction, and it, it, it comes from Matthew 9. And beginning in verse 36, I'm reading from the NLT here. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. My son, my pastor, reminds our congregation of this every single Sunday. It is our benediction. It's our close every Sunday. As we read it together on the screen, he reminds us, don't say that there aren't people to reach. Don't even say that they're difficult people to reach. Jesus has always promised us that the harvest is great. And by the wording of that, it means that people are ready to hear the gospel. They're receptive to the gospel but the workers are few. And so one of the great emphases of our church, and we we have seen evangelistic fruit as a result, is for the people of the body of Christ to be a part of those harvest fields. Mm -hmm. And several years ago, I I wrote a book called The Unchurched Next Door. And the premise behind the book was how do unchurched people, how do non-Christian unchurched people feel about church? And when I wrote that book and my research team came back with the results, I have to admit that even I was surprised. Only 5% of North American unchurched non-Christians, we limited it to Canada and the U.S., only 5% were antagonistic to the gospel. Only 5% were antagonistic to Christians. And I would think otherwise, hearing the media and hearing other sources that there's a more antagonistic world, they may be unchurched and they may not, and they may be, uh, ha- have certain views of who Christians are, but we found a very low percentage were actually antagonistic. And biblically, Christ has said that the, their harvest fields, they're ready for harvest. They're white unto harvest. And our role during this post-pandemic time is not as necessarily to hope that we can find people to share the gospel with is to get people into those gospel fields, however that takes place. So, Just wanted to tie number five to number four. Number six, the shifting role of staff and the growth of bivo and covo. I don't know how your church is staff. Some of you already may be bivocational. I I, I have a slight nuance difference between a bivocational, say, pastor or any person on staff, but just say pastor and a co-vocational. A bivocational is such because the church financially cannot pay a pastor full time. Co-vocational is someone who chooses to keep one foot in the marketplace and one foot as a pastor or staff person in a church, even though that person may be able to get full-time pay from the church. So Bavo is a financial necessity. Covo is an intentional decision. As a result of the pandemic, we have seen the trend of Bavo and Covo accelerate and become exacerbated. We're seeing more and more staff and even pastors not become full-time in terms of compensation from the church, but to have other vocational roles. There's a church in South Florida simply called Family Church. The pastor's name is Jamie Scroggins. Like many large churches, and his is, they they are multi-site, but they're multi-site in a different type of way. They have never built another church. Uh, They've gone in and helped churches in neighborhoods survive, and some of those churches have said, we want to come under your umbrella an intentional decision that the lead pastor, Jimmy Scroggins, made in this church from the onset was 
he was not going to heavily staff them in terms of personnel cost. Instead, he would seek to raise up people within the church and maybe outside the church, but those who would probably be more likely to be part-time. So now one of the pastors in his, in their 14 uh, sites is a physician. Uh, another one is an attorney. Uh, two or three of them are, are businessmen. And so they are co-vocational. This trend of bivo and covo at the pastor level, but at the entire staff level, has grown significantly. And we also see it growing significantly coming out of COVID as we go into a post-pandemic world. Number seven, the repurposing of church facilities. I, of course, I don't, I don't know contextually what your church facility is like. Uh, wouldn't know wouldn't know of any what they what they are like. Uh, you 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 may be in a school renting a place, or you may be in a storefront, or you may be in a building that has a lot of age and wear and tear and deferred maintenance on it. Uh, whatever the case may be, but one thing we're seeing clearly coming out of the uh, uh, pandemic is the whole thought of church facilities. There, there, there's almost a cliche that uh, I have repeated to me so many times that I almost have a little bit of cringe factor every time I hear it. Well, the building is not the church. The church is the people. I get it. Uh, totally get that. Biblically correct. And I don't, I don't need to have a condescending attitude. It's just I've heard it so many times. The church is not the building. The building is the people. But listen, your church's address is no accident. God put your church, your people there at a specific address for a specific reason. And oftentimes that address includes a building. It includes a facility. And we're seeing church facilities be repurposed. What is the major thing that we're seeing among church facilities as the repurposing takes place? The major thing we're seeing is that the church facilities are being used more and more for the community and by the community. Let me repeat that. Church facilities are being used more and more by the community and for the community. And so we, we, we're, we're watching this trend take place where many churches, their building was somewhat of a fortress where it is for us, it is for our members, and we may occasionally have some type of event over here for the community. But what we're seeing is... Uh, the, these buildings that many churches have available seven days a week are not being used seven days a week, and it has a high stewardship connotation to it or low stewardship connotation to it. And we're seeing more and more of these church facilities be used for community and evangelistic Great Commission gospel-bearing purposes. And so I am, I am encouraged because it indicates that there's a greater stewardship that is taking place. We have a lot of good partnerships. Church Answers, one of our partnerships, an organization out of North Carolina called uh, Cool Solutions Group. Uh, sometimes uh, they also go by the name Smart Solutions Group. And all they do, all they do is help churches use their facilities more efficiently. That's the extent of it. They don't build, they don't renovate, they just help churches to use their facilities more efficiently. Uh, the CEO of that company, Tim Cole, has told me on more than one occasion how he's getting more and more people contact him, more and more church leaders, because they say, we've got to find out new ways to use our church facilities. I'm also seeing in the context of church facilities, worship center sanctuary size being reduced. There is a major trend that is taking place in North America, and that major trend is this church gathering sizes are getting smaller. Some of that naturally is due to churches declining, but that's not the extent of it. Another thing that is taking place is with the boomers, my generation, beginning to fade away. Boy, that sounds like I'm really old. And then it just hit me. Yes, I am really old. But as, as our generation gets older and older, those born between 1946 and 1964, the boomers were the primary generation that fueled what we call the bigger box type of church, where, where you, you would have hundreds and in some cases even thousands that could fit into one uh, worship center. What we're seeing now with millennials and Gen Z is a desire for more intimate settings. And so many churches that are growing 
and will be growing post post pandemic are growing horizontally more than they're growing vertically. In other words, a horizontal growth means we try to put all the people in one site, usually on Sunday morning. Uh, that's vertical growth. Horizontal growth means we may have uh, an ethnic group that uh, meets in our church on a Sunday afternoon or some other day of the week. Uh, we, we may have uh, uh, Wednesday night services at our current facility. That's horizontal growth or Tuesday night. Horizontal growth also is a part of the multi-site phenomenon. And we're also seeing more and more micro churches in the multi-site where the new sites typically have people, a uh, number of the attendance of under 40 uh, with not, not much in, uh, desire to get larger than that, but just to continue to grow uh, horizontally as well. So all of this is boiling down to church facilities are looking differently, will be built differently, and will be adapted differently as we go into this post-pandemic world as we move in here. Number eight, the digital mission field. is amazing to watch during the pandemic. Churches go to streaming services. Man, I, I, saw, I saw one pastor on Facebook early on in this said, we had 23 in our church before we shut down this last week, and we shut down, and uh, I had over 2,000 people watching my Facebook Live. We're now a mega church. <laughs> well, that number didn't stand for long. It was it was a uh, it. There was a big blip for a little while. In fact, Facebook uh, actually had to uh, restart a few times during the early stages of the pandemic just because so many, so many churches were streaming via Facebook Live. Well, that phenomenon of that big spike obviously settled down a bit, but digital streaming has not gone away. And if you're asking, what should I do with my digital streaming service? I don't know if that'd be one of the questions that you would ask, but I'm, I'm going to anticipate it. I would say absolutely not. I do think that the in-person gathered is going to have a lot more benefit than the digital, but there are going to be people that will come to your service digitally that will not come in person. And this has more implications just beyond the pandemic. Some of it could have to do with, uh, would have to do with people who are not physically able to come, but uh, digital services are beginning to become a place where people are trying out your church, testing it before they actually come in person. One person uh, in a recent uh, presentation I made asked me this question, will our digital services cannibalize or hurt our in-person? Maybe a little bit but we anticipate that it'll actually help more. And I'll talk about that in just a second, a few seconds. We anticipate that it will help more than hurt. In fact, if we, we, we would say that if you do your digital service well, it actually can become, and this is my number nine, it can become a digital funnel. And by digital funnel, what I'm saying is we're seeing some churches that are having a high degree of intentionality, moving people from the digital presence to an in-person presence. Let me give you an example of how that is taking place in a lot of churches even now. Many churches had their digital services and, and, and they didn't have in-person. They start moving to in-person. Some of the churches abandoned digital altogether. They minimize uh, its, its value. But some churches have been highly intentional about the digital service. And so what they do is they try to move people into closer and closer to in-person. Obviously, if they're in another part of the world or even another part of the province, that, that's not going to happen. But if they are there locally, these churches that are doing this intentionally actually have somewhat of a funnel in place. You come into the digital service, you have someone from your church that actually serves as a digital shepherd, a pastor, whatever you want to call that person. And that person tries to start a small group from the digital service. That small group is digital as well. You get to know people better. Obviously, there's a lot of anonymity in a digital service. Now you get to know them better if they're on Zoom, even if they're in boxes on a screen. As you get to know them better, there's an intentionality to then have someone from your church connect with someone who's on that screen, maybe take them for coffee, and then ultimately move them to your worship service. We're seeing churches already that are successfully seeing that funnel move very, very well. So 
what I would say is your digital mission field is still there. Uh, I often refer to the digital world as the Roman road. In the first century, when the Roman roads were there for the spreading of the gospel, they had been there for a couple of centuries, but they had they, they find that the Roman roads had finally gotten to the point where they were used widespread, not only for military use, not, not only for control of the Roman Empire at the time, but, but also for commerce. And sometimes those Roman roads were used for evil purposes, to, to wait for people to come by and to, to uh, attack them and rob them. And that became common on the Roman roads as well. But God took that which some people intended for evil and used it for good. And the Roman roads became the number one physical conduit for the traveling of the gospel in the first century and in the early second century. Without the Roman road from a human perspective, the gospel would not have traveled. Even the gospel that was across waters, ultimately people had to travel from one part of land to another before they got on their boat. The Roman road, we have a Roman road today, and it is the digital world. It is the internet. And it is, yes, it's used for evil, but God can use it for good as well. So those two, number eight, the digital mission field, and number nine, the digital funnel, kind of go together. But what an incredible opportunity that is out there. My tenth and final point is this. The re-emergence of high expectations. I have been writing, pleading, exhorting, encouraging churches to raise the bar for some time. What I mean by raising the bar is we should not take lightly our local congregations. There are two institutions in the Bible that God holds up as models. One is the institution of the family. And the other is the institution of the church, specifically the local congregation. From Acts 2 to the early chapters of the book of Revelation, almost all of everything that we read is tied to a local church. Our local congregations are imperfect. They're full of hypocrites, including ourselves. They have problems. They have cantankerous people. They have bullies. They have a lot of not negative things in them. They have critics. But God has intended to use his local church. We who are leaders must have the bar raised in terms of what we expect of our people who are a part of the local church. Remember the statement that I made earlier. We have dumped down church membership so much in many churches that for many it means nothing. It is just another social or civic organization. High expectations was a trend that was in place before the pandemic. It has been accelerated and exacerbated. What are some of the manifestations of uh, high expectations? More entry point classes, new membership class, whatever you want to call them. Uh, more entry point classes now include expectations as much as they do information. As a matter of fact, I encourage church leaders that any entry point class for membership should it have three major categories? It should have information about the church, expectation of the members, and a beginning process to assimilate the members. Any membership class should have information, expectation, and assimilation. That middle one, expectation, is going to be critical to the health and life of the church. And many of the reasons that we have consumer Christians in our churches is because we have not expected much of them. And so they see church membership as something for the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. Therefore, as we exit the pandemic, as we begin to, in the months, God willing ahead, see things return to some degree of normalcy, don't look back and see that all of these things were really bad for the church. I see these as a key opportunity for local churches. It is a chance to look at church life as a blank slate. Change receptivity is up in many congregations because the pandemic changed so many things. This is not just a difficult time with all the challenges of sickness, death, economic chaos that the pandemic caused. It is a chance also for this blank slate to be restated. And when the blank state is filled with biblical truth about what our local church can do, it becomes an incredible opportunity 
becomes an incredible an opportunity for our churches. My last word to you, ladies and gentlemen, as we wrap this up and we go into question and answer time, is that you have a blank slate. What are you going to do with that blank slate? Look at it as a tremendous opportunity, not merely an obstacle or a challenge that we had to come through. 